Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about CBD. The story begins, however, with cannabis sativa, the plant. The plant contains two different kinds of chemicals that are of interest to us. It contains marijuana, which is used synonymously with THC, and it contains hemp, two strains, the same plant. It can be cultivated for higher concentration of the THC, but it also contains the other cannabinoids and a variety of other substances as well. Or it could be cultivated principally for the hemp. Hemp could be used for paper or clothing or food, but now obviously for CBD and a variety of other cannabinoids with very low concentration of the THC. Cannabis sativa, the plant, came to the Western Hemisphere in the 1500s and actually there are four different species. We all talk about cannabis sativa, but there's also cannabis indica, cannabis ruderalis, cannabis afghanica, Western use cannabis sativa, but it's been selectively bred over a period of time so that we have plants that have higher concentration of THC and plants that have higher concentrations of CBD. So when we talk about hemp, hemp itself has more than 540 different natural compounds, more than 100 other cannabinoids that are partially related to the CBD, more than a hundred different botanical compounds, all with their own biological effects. Now the major psychotropic effect obviously is due to the THC, the Delta-9 THC. The major non-psychoactive component has to do with the CBD. CBD is actually the second most active constituent of the cannabis sativa plant. CBD, unlike in some animals, is not converted in humans to THC. So we know that there are probably significant biological functions of the cannabinoids. We know that because the body makes its own natural cannabinoids. It makes an andamide and it makes arachidonoglycerol that work on cannabinoid receptors inside the brain and inside the vessels. We also can get the cannabinoids as phytocannabinoids, plant-related. That's the CBD and the THC and cannabigerol and a variety of other cannabis-related compounds. Then we also have the synthetic cannabinoids. So those are derived in a laboratory. That would be dronabinol and nabilone. Those are the legal products. Then we have a variety of substances that are sold on the street, K2 and spice. Gets us into a lot of trouble, unfortunately. Well, most people extrapolate the safety of cannabis and the cannabis-derived substances like CBD from the long history of recreational use. CBD doesn't have the euphoric effect, the psychoactive effect of the THC, so it's assumed, geez, it's got to be very safe. But maybe since it hasn't been studied in people with all different kinds of diseases, maybe it's benign just in people who are otherwise relatively healthy, and it all depends on how you're getting the CBD into your body. Is it a purified product? Is it a major component of a botanical extract from the cannabis or the hemp plant? Or are you taking the whole plant? Well, the flowers and the leaves are what contain the phytocannabinoids. Very little or none in the seeds. So cannabis is not approved at the present time for the treatment of any disease or condition, but we do have an almost pure form of CBD sold as Epidiolex. Epidiolex is for epilepsy, specific types of epilepsy, in individuals who are at least two years of age. Then there's Marinol and Dronabinol. Those are synthetic THCs. They're used for anorexia and weight loss and AIDS. And then we have sesamet or nabilone. That's also a synthetic cannabinoid, THC, of course. And that's used in the nausea and vomiting of cancer chemotherapy. But let's concentrate on Epidiolex for a minute. That's a CBD, and it's an oral form, and it's almost pure. It comes in 100 milligrams per milliliter, sold in 100 milliliter bottles, and it's specifically for the Lennox-Gastaut or the Dravet syndrome. Those are types of epilepsy that affect children and then obviously continue as they grow into adulthood. 
So we can get an idea about how CBD might work from studying the epidiolex. So the starting dose is about 5 milligrams per kilogram a day, or 250 milligrams for a 110-pound individual, or maintenance dose is about 500 milligrams for a 110-pound individual. The titration could go up to 20 milligrams, so about 1,000 milligrams for the 110-pound individual, and in rare cases, up to 50 milligrams per kilogram. The cash price for a 150-pound person is going to be about $32,500, according to the company. Obviously, that's a substantial amount of money. The dose, as you increase the amount you take, you don't get a proportional increase in the concentration in the bloodstream. When you take the compound, take the epidiolex, it peaks out after about two and a half to five hours. The elimination time is about 60, six zero hours. If it's taken with high fat, high calorie meal, it will increase in the concentration inside the system by about five fold, but comes without any specific recommendations taking it with food or without food. Actually, in Europe, it's available only if it's taken with a benzodiazepine known as clobazam, Lepidiolex, 94% bound to the proteins in the body. Its main metabolite is 7-hydroxycannabidiol, or CBD. It's biologically active, and it's subsequently changed to 7-carboxy-CBD. The area under the curve for this substance is about 40 times greater than the CBD itself, and it seems that the 7-carboxy-CBD might also have some anti-convulsant activity. It's excreted in the feces. A little bit goes out in the urine. It's a Schedule 5 drug. That means it has low risk of abuse. It was approved in June of 2018. Contains less than 0.1% THC. All other CBD components, all other CBD products, are considered by the federal government as Schedule 1. That means that they supposedly have a high risk of abuse and harm. There's limited or no medical value, according to the federal government, illegal to possess. But they also passed the Rohrabacher Farr Amendment in 2014 that needs periodic update and approval by the Congress. And that amendment bars the Department of Justice from spending any funds to keep the states from implementing their own laws with regard to CBD and medical marijuana. So let's see how the product works when we talk about the lennox gusto syndrome, looking at people between the ages of 2 and 55. On baseline, these people had 85 seizures on average a month. So at 1,000 milligrams a day, they were able, for a 110-pound individual, to reduce the number of seizures by about 42 percent. At a lower dose, 10 milligrams per kilogram a day, 500 milligrams total a day for a 110-pound individual, they were able to reduce the number of seizures by 40 percent compared to placebo, only reduced the number of seizures by about 17 percent. So it seems that in the lennox gusto syndrome, that the drug, the CBD, the epidiolex, is very helpful. It reduces the number of seizures by somewhere around 50 percent. Doesn't completely eliminate them. How about the Dravet syndrome? Well, again, same kind of dose. So 44-pound individual, 400 milligrams, 100-pound individual taking about 1,000 milligrams, 154-pound individual taking 1,500 milligrams, adding it to the regular routine of the anti-epileptic medicine looking at people who have a baseline of 12 seizures per month, the medicine, the epidiolex, the CBD, reduce the number of seizures by about 50 percent, down to about six seizures. So that's obviously very good. The percent who had at least a 50 percent reduction in the seizures, 40 percent with the epidiolex, about 25 percent with placebo. Complete response? Now, only 5% with the epidiolex versus none with the placebo. So overall, we have significant improvement, but we don't have complete cure. We don't have complete suppression of the epileptic attacks, and that's given basically pure CBD. Now, in another study, looking at about 214 individuals who had seizures of different types, 
again, able to reduce the number of seizures from about 30 a month on average down to about 15 or 16 a month on average. So somewhere around a 30 to a 50 percent reduction in the seizures. So that's obviously quite good. But it's important to realize that, again, looking at a study with 306 individuals, only 15 of them had a complete response. So it's not a drug that's going to completely eliminate seizures. It's going to be helpful in those individuals who are taking a significant amount so remember the doses that we talked about now. Side effects, are there any? Yes, there are. So it causes abnormal liver function tests. It causes increase in some of the liver enzymes in the bloodstream in up to 15% of the individuals. And that means that if you happen to have a history of hepatitis or you drink too much alcohol, you have pre-existing liver injury or taking medicines that might injure your liver, you better be careful if you're going to take some CBD. It can cause sedation and somnolence and lethargy and fatigue in about a third of the individuals, but that increased to about 50% if they were taking the clobazam in addition. It decreases the appetite in about 20% of the people, causes diarrhea in somewhere between 10 and 20%, causes weight loss in about one person in 20, causes insomnia. People are taking it for a sleeping medicine, but causes insomnia in about 10% of people who are taking it might cause some anemia, and because of its effect on the immune system, it might lead to an increased incidence of infection. Now, CBD is a drug, obviously. So it's not biologically inert. And it can interact with a variety of other medicines and with other medical conditions. So you ought to have a reason to take it. It's probably not a good idea, just like it's not a good idea to take an aspirin just because, well, I don't have anything better to do. And aspirin's supposed to help you, so I'm going to take an aspirin. We don't take CBD unless you have a reason to take it, unless it can possibly improve something. A few drops that you take in a smoothie or in a beverage is unlikely to do anything. It seems that it's being sold now as a panacea. But people worry that if you have some symptoms that you might not go and seek medical care. You might delay a diagnosis or a treatment. People are using it to alleviate some cancer symptoms or treat neurologic diseases or treat heart conditions or enhance bone health. But the evidence is kind of sketchy. So in 2016, 84 CBD products purchased on the internet were evaluated. These were from 31 different companies. They were tested in triplicate. They were considered labeled accurately if they contained anywhere between 90 and 110 percent of what the label said, and only 30 percent were correctly labeled. 40 percent were underlabeled, and 26 percent were overlabeled. The accuracy of the label if you're using a vaporization liquid, it was only about 12 percent. You use the tincture, the likelihood of the label dose being correct is only 25 percent. About 45 percent of the oils were correctly labeled. And, as a matter of fact, 20 percent of the products actually had significant levels of THC. And that means that you have to be careful if you work in a workplace that's going to require periodic blood testing because if you buy some CBD from the internet or elsewhere, it might also have some THC in it and the THC is going to show up on a blood test or a urine test and then you might be fired. Well, what's the purity of the substances? Again, the Virginia Commonwealth University looked at 100 samples and they found nine of those samples that were labeled as having 100% natural CBD. These were vaping liquids. Actually, four of them had synthetic compounds linked to anxiety and convulsions and psychoses and hospitalization and death. And the University of Pennsylvania recently evaluated some products and they found 70% of CBD products that they tested and analyzed were mislabeled. In the Czech Republic, they looked at 29 CBD products and they found about 70% of them contained excessive levels of the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that are carcinogens. In the Netherlands, they looked at eight CBD products. They found four of them were correctly labeled. Two of them had more CBD than the label up to 35% more, and two of them had less CBD, up to 98% less. So the consumer's labs 
they say that the label doses of CBD bear very little resemblance to what's actually contained in the product that you buy. And you can buy about 10 milligrams of the product for anywhere between 80 cents and $4.50 for the, exactly the same thing. FDA says many products contain little or no CBD in contrast to the label. So the products have to be tested. And they have to be tested for the foreign matter and for the moisture content and for the solvent residue from the extraction because after all it's a plant you got to get the product out of it. They have to be screened for heavy metals and for pesticides and for bacteria and for some mycotoxins. They have to be screened for the potency. Now the testing samples, that's a little bit dicey area because most of the CBD is manufactured by relatively smaller companies and they are the ones that have to protect the consumers. They send the samples to the testing companies, but they get to choose which testing companies. And the product that they send to the testing companies isn't the product necessarily that's going to be sold to you, the consumer. Some states don't even inspect the production or the manufacturing facilities. And many states don't even verify the contents of CBD that are advertised. And you have to remember also that the plant itself growing in nature is what we call a bioaccumulator. So it absorbs heavy metals and pesticides from the soil. As an example, in November of 2019 in Nevada, a license for a testing company was suspended for the second time over inaccurate and misleading potency results. Because the companies get to pick which testing company they want to send their material to and the testing companies have an incentive to over-label, to change the label, well, unfortunately, all of that might result in you getting something other than what you think you're buying. Well, if you get the import from Europe, just overall imports from Europe, not from China, not from Russia, but from Europe, they have more stringent requirements. Number one, for low THC levels, their level is less than 0.2%, and they have a more established regulatory system than we have here in the United States. Now, if you're going to be tested, the question is, if you use CBD, is it going to show up on a urine screen or a blood test? And the answer is no. On the other hand, if the CBD that you use actually contains a moderate amount of THC, then yes, it may show up. So you can get fired for using what you think is CBD, but it also contains too much THC. So just imagine, if you were taking a small amount of CBD, say 10 milligrams, and it was supposed to have less than 0.3% THC, so that's a tiny amount. It's not going to show up. On the other hand, if you're taking a bigger dose, let's say you're taking 1,000 milligrams of CBD, now that 0.3 milligrams is going to be a substantial amount, and that might show up on the test. So you do have to be careful. The serum test, basically the same thing. The serum test doesn't look for metabolites of CBD, both the urine test and the serum test, they look for metabolites of the THC. So you have to be careful. So what about the good manufacturing processes? Good manufacturing processes would allow you to go and buy an aspirin, doesn't make any difference what the company is, it's all going to be manufactured by good manufacturing processes. You go over to the Costco, you go over to the Walgreens, you go over to the grocery store, and you buy anything off the shelf. Chances are it's going to have been tested. Well, unfortunately, we don't have in the CBD industry any regulation on labeling, on purity, on reliability, and there's no consistency necessary between one product and another. Now you have to realize that the CBD is harvested from a plant. So you're buying something that you think is more concentrated. So you have to grow the plant, then you harvest the plant, then you strip it of the flower and the leaves, then you send it to a processing facility, then it's ground up, then we have to extract it. It's extracted with either CO2 or sometimes other compressed gases or ethanol or methanol, and then 
we have to use some temperature to extract it and some alcohol, and then there's the distillation process. And then sometimes it's what we call winterized to remove undesirable substances. If we want the CBD to be isolated by itself, then alcohol could be added, it could be frozen, then it could be heated to boiling, and then it could be distilled, and all of that to get you the hemp or the CBD. So it's currently approved for epilepsy and MS and cancer-related nausea and vomiting and multiple sclerosis for the muscle spasms, but the rest of the uses that people are talking about are potential uses. We don't have any real good information, but the number of conditions and diseases is enormous. So let's look at some of them. It's used for pain, it's used for inflammatory disease, inflammatory bowel disease, and HIV. It's used for generalized anxiety and social anxiety disorder and depression and psychiatric abnormalities and PTSD. It's used as a neuroprotectant. It's used to treat Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. It's used to affect the reward center so that people can be able to stop smoking. It's used very frequently for pain management and for stress or anxiety, for sleep, to ease cancer symptoms or neurologic symptoms. Actions in the body, well, it's analgesic. It is a painkiller in some. It has anti-emetic, anti-vomiting, anti-inflammatory effects, anti-seizure effects. It's neuroprotective. It works to prevent new blood vessels from being formed, anti-angiogenic, which is important because it also decreases cancer cell growth. It's antioxidant, causes the vessels to dilate. It's antidepressant, it's anti-anxiety medicine. It has exactly the opposite effects of THC. THC causes euphoria. Instead, CBD is antipsychotic, anti-anxiety, anti-seizure, anti-inflammatory, and anti-euphoric. It's used for epilepsy, of course. We've mentioned that. We have, unfortunately, 1% of the population affected with epilepsy. We have more than 20 drugs available to treat it, but a third of the people have inadequate control. So many people are now turning to CBD because of the history of improvement with epidiolex. Well, do we have significant improvement? Well, some people do, but you have to be careful because of the contamination and the pesticides and the heavy metals. And actually in Utah, people using it for seizures, actually some developed seizures who were otherwise well controlled, they developed the seizures and confusions and hallucinations from the CBD because the product that they were using actually had a synthetic cannabinoid in it used for schizophrenia. In a randomized controlled trial, it decreased the symptom, at least to some measure, in people with schizophrenia at a dose of 1,000 milligrams a day, mild improvements. The percent improved was about 80% versus about 60% with placebo. The percent who still were markedly or severely ill went from 80% down to 55% with uh, CBD went from 80% to 60 some odd percent with placebo. Another study showed that actually 800 milligrams of CBD was as good as one of the atypical antipsychotics. Seems like in schizophrenia there's an increase in the receptor density for the cannabinoids, the CBD or the THC. So increased sensitivity theoretically to any of the THC that might be in the product, but fortunately the CBD is helpful in animal models at least with schizophrenia at a relatively high dose, dose anywhere between 600 milligrams, 1500 milligrams and human equivalents. Sometimes the studies have shown equivocal results been studied in anxiety in normal volunteers that decreased the anxiety from taking the THC, so it counteracts the THC. It seems that it impedes the ability of THC to stimulate the CB1 receptor. And people who have stress from public speaking, seems like a dose of 300 milligrams, single dose, has greater benefit actually than a larger dose or a higher dose, smaller dose or a higher dose. It has a U-shaped relationship, so if you take too little, it doesn't help. If you take too much, it doesn't help. 
the sweet spot was about 300 milligrams. Not as robust as if you took a clonopin, but clonopin would cause some sedation. Doesn't have the side effects of some of the beta blockers or the benzodiazepines. If you take it before stress, some sort of a stressful event, well, the results vary, and they vary with the dose and the manufacturer and the route of administration and the time you take it before the stress. It has procognitive effects. It counteracts the amotivational syndrome or the psychosis associated with THC. The CBD doesn't amplify any psychopathology. It has beneficial effects on the brain function. It actually counteracts the memory impairment to some degree that you get with the THC. Now, in spite of all of this, the American Psychiatric Association says there's not really enough evidence to support its use in anxiety or PTSD or sleep disorder or depression. And again, they worry about perhaps delay in seeking help. For Alzheimer's disease, CBD might prevent the tau protein hyperphosphorylation and some of those neurofibrillary tangles that mess up your brain cells might target the amyloid precursor protein for removal from the body, has effects on a variety of other substances. It prevents one of the signaling compounds like NFKB from being transcribed in the nucleus and, and causing some pro-inflammatory genes to be transcribed. It decreases some of the cell death, so that's obviously beneficial in Parkinson's disease at a dose of three milligrams per kilogram in animals, seems to decrease the decline in dopamine and actually cause complete remission in some animals, but it seemed to work only immediately after the animals were given an injection that would deplete the dopamine. So that's not really practical in humans, but it does cause less sleep fragmentation in Parkinson's disease. And that's obviously quite helpful because a lack of sleep seems to cause more rapid deterioration in some individuals. It's theorized to be helpful in migraine headaches for people with sleep. Two months, 80% were better, 20% were worse at a dose of 75 milligrams or 300 milligrams, which is a lot more than most people are taking. It seems to stop the REM sleep suppression caused by anxiety. Doesn't change the non-REM sleep. That's part of the reason it might be helpful in PTSD, because people with PTSD have altered REM sleep. And they also complain of insomnia, CBD for sleep. In some people, tested at 160 milligrams. That increased the quality of the sleep, increased the total sleep time less sleep fragmentation, especially in people who had some other disease like Parkinson's disease, decreased the restlessness, decreased fatigue and muscle tension, decreased the uh, difficulty that people have with concentration. But it's not proven for any of these disorders. For the eye, it's always talked about as a treatment for glaucoma, but it has a very short half-life, only about four hours, that would be useful and it's only a modest decline in the intraocular pressure, so it doesn't really seem like it's a good therapy for glaucoma, but people are talking about it as a treatment perhaps for uveitis or age-related macular degeneration or diabetic eye disease. Also, as far as the inflammatory bowel disease, regional enteritis or Crohn's disease might decrease the inflammation obviously could be helpful in some individuals who have multiple sclerosis and has spasms or spasticity or bladder problems, lack of coordination. All relatively small studies suggest these things. For pain, might help in people who have kidney problems, might help in people with headache or fibromyalgia or arthralgia or myalgias or gastrointestinal pain seems that there is some benefit. How important the benefit is, can't really say. For people with chest pain, might have some modest effect, might be anti-inflammatory. So some of the negative emotional processing that occurs in the amygdala, well, that might be reduced. So we could consider its anti-inflammatory effect and the anti-pain effect might go together to change the pain experience. 
Maybe it's helpful for people who have chronic pain and use opioids. Maybe it decreases the opioid-seeking behavior because it can help reduce the pain in cardiovascular disease. It's possible that it's a vasorelaxant. It opens up some of the vessels. Could do that by releasing nitric oxide or cyclooxygenase or superoxide dismutase, all sorts of things. Decrease oxygen free radicals. It seems there might even be a newly described cannabinoid receptor on the endothelial cells, the cells that line the blood vessels. We know about the CB1 receptor in the brain, the CB2 receptor in the brain and the vessels and other areas of the body. Well, there might also be an endothelial cannabinoid receptor and then result in some cardioprotective activity, decrease inflammation associated with an infarction, decrease the diabetic cardiomyopathy, may decrease some of the harm due to elevated blood sugar. And it's thought to have some anti-neoplastic activity, anti-proliferative, anti-invasive. Maybe it targets different stages in tumor progression, maybe the migration or the invasion or the metastases or the cancer growth and spread. Might increase the cell death in cancer cells, might be chemopreventive for individuals if they're at risk for lung cancer or colon cancer. In breast cancer, it seems to inhibit the proliferation of the ER positive, ER negative cells. Maybe even be good for triple negative tumors. Increases the apoptosis, increases the death of the cancer cells. Might be good for lung cancer, brain cancer, colon cancer. Seems to decrease the metastases. Down regulate some of the survival signaling of the cancer cells, so it's anti-proliferative. And remember, it decreases the angiogenic factors, so that helps. It's also been thought to help people with obsessive compulsive disorder, or type 2 diabetes, and acne, and seborrheic dermatitis. Or seems to help the behavioral disorders of dementia, spinal cord injury helps in people who have irritable bowel syndrome or Tourette syndrome or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Huntington's disease, been linked to the runner's high. It's been linked to an overall sense of well-being, more rapid recovery from a workout, promote the natural sense of well-being. It decreases the reinforcing effects of some morphine. So it seems that it might help reduce the use of some of the opioids. Now, all of those things that I just mentioned, those are potential. Those aren't reality right now. There's limited evidence that any of that, other than the epidiolex, for which it has been quite well shown, and it only reduces the seizure rate by about 50%, but we don't really know whether CBD is going to work. There's not major research that's been done other than for epilepsy. Everything that I reviewed is an optimistic report of what might happen. You can't hang your hat on anything that I just mentioned. These are laboratory tests and animal tests and small tests in humans. And remember, the CBD that you purchase is not necessarily going to be identical from batch to batch, and even a small change in the concentration may allow some diseases to fall out of control. And even though people talk about it being 100% natural, you don't have any guarantee that there's any CBD in the product that you buy. So watch our part two of the show and learn some more about CBD. Anyway. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend. Consider subscribing so you'll be notified as we post new shows. Thank you for your interest. Appreciate your time. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.